In the 1880s, two businessmen by the name of Richard Sears and Alva Roebuck started a small mail order company. They sold watches. In the 1890s, the Sears and Roebuck Company expanded, and they sold not only watches and jewelry, but they sold buggies and bicycles and sporting goods and sewing machines. And just about 15 years after that, they started even selling houses. You could buy a house kit, and they would send it to you on the railroad. Some assembly required, right? In 1925, Sears opened their first brick-and-mortar store here in Chicago, And 25 years later, in the 1950s, there were over 700 Sears stores across the country, from 1 to 700 in 25 years. You can do the math as to how many that is per year. For decades, this company was a force to be reckoned with. They set the tone as far as as as, uh, uh, merchandising went. They, They created catalogs. They taught America how to shop. Uh, they, and, and they told other companies how to relate to their, their people. They had pictures of their factories and their warehouses uh, that related to them. They shaped the way that we would shop for generations. And those house kits that they sold, well, they shaped the landscape of neighborhoods across the country. Even Batavia, a number of the craftsman house, houses here in town were built from these Sears kits. And in 1969, they had a bright idea. They said, we're such a great company. Let's build a great tower. Let's build a skyscraper. Uh, And and so they did. Over four years, they built the Sears Tower, 110 stories tall. It was the tallest building in the world at the time, and it would be for the next 25 years as well. With this iconic building, they they didn't just shape the neighborhoods uh, in in America. They didn't just shape uh, how we did our spending. They actually shaped the skyline of Chicago into what it is today. I'm reminded of it every time I drive downtown and I come around the corner and I see there's, there's a Sears Tower. You know, every time that you you come downtown, you're walking around, even if you just see a picture of the city, you know it's Chicago because there's the Sears Tower, now the Willis Tower, standing there. I'm sure that most of us have probably had the experience of standing uh, on street level uh, below the Sears Tower and looking up and just saying, wow, that's really big, right? It's impressive. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's awe-inspiring, The same decade that the Sears Tower was completed, the company started to decline in their profits. And that began a decades-long decline, which eventually led us to this year, 2018, when Sears, just a month ago, declared bankruptcy. Absolutely unthinkable when the Sears Tower was built, right? Right? If you had been there, maybe some of you were there that first year that the Sears Tower was completed, 1975, standing at the foot of the tower, marveling at this incredible uh, accomplishment of engineering. Could you imagine this company would go bankrupt in less than 50 years? Could you imagine that in, in, in just about 20 years, the company would actually move out of the building, and about a decade after that, they would lose the naming rights because they couldn't afford it any longer? It would be hard to imagine standing at the foot of such an awesome, impressive, permanent, world-renowned building. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples have been at the temple. And, and, and they're walking around. They're leaving town now. And they're walking past the temple, past the temple mount, on their way out of the city and the, the temple was glorious in that day. It was covered with, with beautiful decorations, rich, ornate, gold. Uh, all, all of this had been rebuilt by Herod the Great in just about the decade, a couple years prior to Jesus' time. Yes, the same Herod that tried to kill Jesus, right, when he was a baby. This Herod had rebuilt the temple along with a new temple mount, huge buildings with huge stones, built in part to communicate the message that Herod is, in fact, Herod the Great. He is great. He is powerful. He can build things that last. Don't mess with Herod. 
Not only that, this temple represents all the Jewish practices of the day. Uh, It's the center of the Jewish world. It's a physical reminder of the power of the priesthood, uh, of uh, of the the religious establishment, the religious leaders who as a group opposed Jesus and his ministry, who would eventually send him to the cross not long after this. And there they are walking along past these glorious buildings, and one of Jesus' disciples gets overwhelmed by the tourism of it all, and he says, look, teacher— What wonderful buildings, what what massive stones, what a tremendous building. It's not unlike one of us standing at the foot of a skyscraper, is it? What a huge building, so permanent. But Jesus doesn't join in this touristic moment, does he? His response is sobering. He says, do you see this great building? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. It's like standing at the foot of the Sears Tower and being told 45 years later the company will be bankrupt. Jerusalem and Herod's court and and, and even the religious leaders didn't recognize uh, what was happening among them. Jesus said there's judgment coming because you didn't see the moment of your coming. They'd been found wanting by God. Jesus himself weeps over the city. He stands up on the hill and he weeps. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, how I wish that I could gather you like a, like a hen gathers her chicks under my wing because here I am, God in flesh, and you didn't recognize the moment of your coming. So consumed, so, so in awe of the building and the, and the religion and the practices and all of this, but you miss the very presence of God with you. It's about 40 years later. When Rome comes and sacks Jerusalem and destroys the temple. Because they didn't see it. They didn't recognize Jesus. God himself walking with them, talking with them, teaching them, healing them. They saw him as a threat. And so they sent him to the cross. He didn't recognize the moment of their coming. So in AD 70, the destruction does come. The Romans come, they tear down the temple, they throw down those stones, and the physical temple is never rebuilt, not even to today. Never rebuilt. But in this passage, Jesus is not just looking forward to AD 70 when this judgment would come. He's looking forward to another day. He's looking forward to his second coming, when, when, when we, he would come and bring everything back to the way that it's intended to be, the day that we are still waiting for. He gets to that later in the chapter, but here he speaks about what his disciples can expect. The disciples ask, what are the signs? What should we look for? What should we watch for? But Jesus doesn't answer the question, if you notice. He he, he talks about that day, but he does not answer their question. He says, many will come in my name. Do not be deceived. Many will come in my name. They will claim to have authority from God. They will claim to be the Messiah. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. Nations will rise up against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be earthquakes. There will be famines, destruction, pain. Things will fall apart. And even these things that seem so permanent now, so powerful now, so lasting, even these things will be destroyed. But why is Jesus telling them all of this? Listen to what he says in verse 7. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. And earlier he says, do not be deceived. Do not be alarmed. Do not be deceived. All of this turmoil, these are things that are part of what's going to happen. And indeed, they did happen in the disciples' lifetime even, before the destruction in 70 AD and the stones were thrown down. But Jesus says, don't be alarmed. None of this is permanent. None of it is meant to be permanent. These words speak to us as well, don't they? Nearly 2,000 years later, after Jesus spoke to his disciples, we too are no stranger to wars and rumors of wars. We're no stranger to natural disasters and tragedies, earthquakes, fires, famine, and on and on it goes. We're surrounded by many people and many things that uh, come in the name of Jesus, so to speak. That is, they come promising us a better life. They come promising that they can save us. They claim to have authority and power from God that lasts. The authority and power to change our lives and shape our world. 
when we read these verses, when we look at the world around us, sometimes we think, well, these must be signs that the end is coming. This must be signs that Jesus is coming back tomorrow or maybe the day after. But Jesus doesn't talk about it this way. Jesus doesn't talk about these things as actually signs. He simply says, these things will come, and then will come the end. But don't be alarmed. Don't be worried. That's the point of this. Don't be alarmed because none of this is permanent. These things aren't even the beginning of the end. They're the birth pains. They're the birth pains of something greater that is coming, but the end is still to come. Jesus tells us that nobody but the Father knows the day or the time, so there's no need for us to guess about that. Instead, Jesus says simply, do not be deceived, do not be alarmed. Just a couple weeks ago, we went to the polls, along with people across our country, The turnout for this uh, midterm election was the highest of any midterm, percentage speaking, uh, in the last uh, century, of any uh, midterm election in the last century. Now, in the run-up to the election, as I'm sure we're all aware, there was a lot of hand-wringing from people from every political perspective. What would happen if this person gets elected? What would happen if if that person gets elected? There's lots of alarm being sounded by people on all sides about where we are headed as a nation. And for some in Christian circles, we look at this and we say, this must be a sign that the end is coming. Now, we need to be engaged citizens. It's good that we care about politics and decisions and policies and laws and codes because these things affect real people's lives. So we try to learn more about the issues. We try to vote according to our conscience. That's an important thing to do. But even while we do this, even while we stand for the things we believe in, even while we struggle for justice and righteousness and equity in this world, let us remember that these things will come and go. They're not permanent. They're not meant to last. Jesus said that they would come and they would go. So do not be alarmed. Do not be deceived. But we don't always experience that, do we? Sometimes we look at our country or any other country or democracy in general And like the disciples, we look up at this incredible thing and we say, Oh, look at these stones, how marvelous! How magnificent, how permanent. And in response, Jesus says, not one stone will be left on another. None of this is forever. And then the end is still to come. On its own, this doesn't seem very hope-filled, does it? Practical, maybe, but not very hopeful. But there is hope. There is hope. Our scripture reading from Daniel today reminds us that there is, in fact, another kingdom that is coming. Another kingdom that is coming, are you with me? One that will not be destroyed. One that lasts forever. A kingdom and a king that truly deserve our awe, our pouring out of of praise and glory and honor. And the power of this kingdom doesn't lie in any building or in any human ruler or even in the collective uh, will of the people, but in the hand of the Almighty One, the Ancient of Days. Chapter 7 of his book, Daniel's describing this incredible vision that God has given him. The thrones are set up, and and, and the Ancient of Days comes, and he sits on the throne. It's a position of great authority. He takes his seat with thousands upon thousands serving him, with ten thousands upon ten thousands standing before him. Have you ever been in a courtroom before when the judge enters? I know some of you have. Have you ever been in a courtroom before the judge enters and the hush falls over the room? Or maybe you've been in a classroom and and the principal comes into the room unannounced, right? And all the kids get very quiet, hopefully, uh, because someone with great power and authority has entered the room. The Ancient of Days comes in. He's seated on his throne, and the court is seated as well, Daniel tells us. Daniel's writing to a marginalized people. They were being oppressed. They were slaves under the, under the hand of Babylon at the time. They lived in a world that was very much not under their control. 
And, and so this vision uh, comes to them. They're, they're living in the context of foreign domination. And, and, and they see these four beasts before the passage that we read today. Four beasts that represent the empire, that represent the leaders that are rulers that are oppressing God's people. And even though these beasts are terrifying, they seem all powerful, even though their authority seems never ending. Daniel's vision tells us that these beasts, in all their terror, in all their majesty, are in fact not uh, where the authority lies. The authority lies with the Ancient of Days. He's the one who holds it. He's the one who's seated on the throne. But that power and authority does not stay in some heavenly realm. No. Did you hear what happened next? The Ancient of Days is seated on the throne. The court begins. And then one like a son of man comes, riding on the clouds. And the Ancient of Days hands him all power and authority and dominion and and gives it to a son of man. That's just a, a circumlocution for a person, a human being, a savior king who has all the authority, all the glory, all the sovereign power. One before all the nations and people will bow. Now for oppressed people, this is really, really good news. Their God is the one who holds true authority. And his power will not stay far off, but it will come near to them through the Son of Man. So near that they can touch him. So near that they can hear him, they can can see him. So near that one day they'll be able to reach out and be healed, both in their physical bodies, but but they'll reach out and be set free from from the oppression of the the empire that has colonized their people, from the oppression of the sin that has colonized their hearts and their minds. Now they will be set free to live in God's kingdom forever. This is good news. This is good news. And this stands in contrast, doesn't it? From, from, from the vision that the disciples have as they stand at the foot of that temple. Stones that, that look so permanent to them. But uh, to God, he sees that these things are not lasting. These things are not, in fact, permanent at all. What is truly lasting, what is truly permanent, is the kingdom of God. The place where the Son of Man will rule. My friends, I am concerned about uh, how we posture ourselves in this kind, in this season. I am, I, am, uh, I, I am particularly aware of the ways that we tend to put our trust and our hope in things that do not last. The season of Advent and Christmas, a time of preparation for the great celebration of the coming of Christ. And yet we so oftentimes turn it into consumerism, We're overcome with the sales and and, and the products and the things that that, that we look at and we say, oh, this must be lasting. Oh, this must have power to change my life, to change my, uh, my, my family's life, to make me happier, to make me more successful. That's just one aspect of it. But, but, but isn't that like standing before the temple and saying, oh, these marvelous stones, these marvelous buildings. We, we look at the Sears Tower. Oh, this incredible company that holds so much power. We live our lives in a way that gives authority over to these things. We give our our awe and our wonder to these things instead of to our God. And 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 and, and we live in a way that uh, that makes us think that that's just okay, but we don't realize how much we are giving over to something that is other than God. I am um, particularly. Remembering um, the, uh, the opportunity that we have to model something different, and to show the world a different way of being, a different way of, of posturing ourselves in this world. The, um, the, the vision that Daniel has was a vision of hope for his people. We too have a vision of hope. We, we, we have a, a story that we've been told about Jesus Christ, the one who has come. We've been given this vision. We've been given this story that is true about Christ who came and died and rose again. It's it's a vision of a kingdom that is lasting. It's a vision of something that is is greater than what this world has to offer for us. And, And just like Daniel, this vision can reorient our lives 
toward God and toward his, uh, his, his desire for our world. The way that we, um, the way that we do that is, is by uh, not standing in awe of the things that this world has to offer. So I wonder how we might change the way that we live, how, how we might change the way that we pray, how we might change uh, the way that we talk with one another even. Because God doesn't want us to stand in fear of the things that are happening around us. He, he doesn't want us to be lost in deception. He doesn't want us to, uh, to, to be found in, in a place where we are just so consumed with alarm uh, that we're not sure where we're going as, as a world or where we are headed. He wants us to live with a quiet confidence. A quiet confidence saying, yes, there may be, there may be uh, earthquakes. There may be things uh, in this world that, that are cause for concern. There may be wars and rumors of wars and all the rest of it. But in fact, what God wants uh, for us is not to be afraid is not to stand in awe of all of that, but instead to take this vision, this vision of Jesus Christ, of his authority and kingdom and power that is so much greater than what the world offers, and say, this is where I will put my hope. This is where I will live. From this center, this is where I will live. This is, this is the, the opportunity that we have as a church, as a people, to say we will not stand in awe of the things that this world has to offer. We will not waste our fear on, on, on the things of this world. No, we will stand in awe of God. We will stand in awe of his kingdom. We will recognize that the kingdom that is coming is so much greater than what this world has to offer. And so we will find peace and hope in him. Next Sunday is Christ the King Sunday. We'll read the texts. We'll sing the songs. It's the last Sunday of the, of the church year before we begin again in Advent. And that day stands as a reminder for us that at the end of the story is nobody else's authority but Christ's. At the end of the day, at the end of everything else, whatever chaos and turmoil we may experience, Christ is seated on the throne. That's the truth. That's the hope. That's the kingdom for which we are striving. And that's the place where we find our fears set aside. So my friends, let us not uh, waste our awe and our wonder and our fear on things that do not last. Jesus has said they will come and go and then will come the end. But do not worry because there is a kingdom that is coming that is so much greater. And that is the kingdom uh, that, that deserves our honor, our glory. Do not fear this world. Fear the Lord, as Scripture says. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do not stand in awe of, of the things that human effort can accomplish. Do not stand in awe of any government or any human leader or any company or any product or any promise that this world makes to us. Stand in awe of the Ancient of Days and the one who is seated on the throne. Let's pray together. God, you are the one who holds authority. You are the one who holds the power. And to you we give our awe and our glory. God, that's why we're gathered here together today. Jesus, when we see things in this world that scare us, and rightly so. Father, we pray that you would put our fear at ease. We pray that you would replace it instead with a quiet confidence that you are in control and that yours is the kingdom that will last. God, give us energy, give us a spirit uh, to fight for justice, to struggle for what is good, to give ourselves uh, toward peace and righteousness. But God, as we do that, um, may we fear you alone. May we give you alone our awe and our praise. Pray all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.